hello everyone. Um, I've already introduced myself, but just to repeat, Dan Elliott, I'm Director of the Transport Practice at Frontier Economics, um, uh, and I've been asked to introduce um, this session on um, airports and airport uh, regulation. Diana, can I step on two slides? Next one. That will do, thank you. So, by way of introduction, I'm, um, I'm going to briefly cover the topic of, in a sense, where we stand with airports at the moment, with like traffic wise, financially wise, move on to talk about um, uh, regulation, design and um, commercial solutions. And I think, and in passing, I think we'll cover the uh, concept of, uh, of connectivity. I am unapologetic, I'm going to try and be quick to try and maximize the amount of time for discussion. And I'm unapologetically mostly going to stay in the territory of ideas, not in terms of a lot of facts about what's been going on. Uh, Michael uh, will, uh, in his comments afterwards, will cover a little bit more of actual steps that in particular Europe have, has been taking to support airports to fill in some gaps and things that I'm saying. By way of one more sort of introductory set of, uh, of comments, I fully understand that when we talk about airports, we are talking about a vast array of different businesses. We have airports that have a few movements a day through to airports that have uh, were pre-pandemic approaching a million movements a year. We have international hub airports, we have domestic feeder airports. Um, we have um, uh, uh, airports that are state owned, that are municipally owned. We have airports that are in public private partnership. We have airports that are privately owned. Of the privately owned airports, we have some that are, are operating time limited concessions of essentially public assets that will be returned to the state at the end of the concession. We have private um, enterprises that wholly own their assets and can do with them more or less as they please. We have airports that have market power. We have airports that have no market power. We have, amongst airports that have market power, we have ones that are uh, regulated with a building block approach. We have light-handed regulation. We have airports, many airports are subject to no regulation at all. So there isn't a one-size-fits-all solution. Um, and um, very much the ideas I'm going to throw out here, you will have to pick and choose how they apply in different contexts because it will become impossible if at each line in each slide we go off into each branch of what might uh, potentially um, be um, uh, be relevant. Um, can I have the next slide please? And the next one, sorry, too many um, um, intertitles in these ones. So just very, very briefly, just to recap, obviously the traffic disaster that we've been discussing yesterday that's had a huge impact on the airline sector has had an equal and obvious exactly the same impact on um, uh, on the airport sector these numbers come from ACI thank you Michael for providing them to me which merely illustrate that even going into early 2021 the levels of traffic we're seeing going through airports are a tiny fraction of anything we anticipated a tiny fraction of where they were pre-pandemic Europe especially the EU has been particularly badly hit, but we know that this is a global phenomenon and, um, um, uh, uh, and, and, and is continuing. Next slide, please. In terms of the financial impact on um, airports, I don't have to hand profit numbers in terms of revenue numbers. ACI were estimating that in 2020, airport losses amounted to a range of 30 billion euros. And although traffic is expected to recover to an extent in 2021, losses of the same level are expected in 2021. And they're not even thinking about what happens uh, going forward. Part of what's happening there is an observation that um, with increasing competitive pressure within the airline sector, uh, revenues are, at airports are going to recover more slowly than traffic because because there will be downward pressure on um, airport charges. Now I will come to talk about that as a sort of contrast between what the commercial pressure is and what the regulatory logic appears to suggest um, airports might do in, in the circumstance. Now, although 
um, profits will not be will have not risen to the level that to the extent same extent that you know, revenues have fallen uh, losses are very very substantial because airports are have a substantial level of fixed cost um, and uh, have for the most part had to remain open to some extent during the course of the pandemic and as a result um, they are not able to adjust down their um, operating costs let alone their fixed capital costs to the extent the traffic has fallen so the the impact on losses is obviously huge next slide please and then this is top this is uh, really very much um, a topic that we were discussing yesterday um, we are all anticipating recovery I think we're all expecting that it's some point in the future traffic will recover to levels that we saw pre-pandemic but none of us is going to actually um you know stake our entire career on predicting exactly when that's going to be it is intrinsically very very difficult to know um as you know the the, um, the lower graph here shows you know also we have been through a process of continuously over overestimating the rate of recovery um, that doesn't mean that will continue forever. There may come a point where we underestimate the rate of recovery, but it's intrinsically very, very difficult to know um, how fast things are going to recover. So um, I'm going to go on to now to the policy discussion. I'm going to slip, let's skip on two slides, please, to nine, slide 10. Thank you. So I'm really going to cover three questions very quickly and really only one or two slides on each of these to really accelerate us into a, into a discussion. The first is I'm going to think about whether, from a policy point of view, we need to address the past, that the, there is an argument for compensating airports for the losses they have suffered or the losses they continue to suffer in the current, uh, ongoing current uh, crisis. The second is whether, is what policies one might consider to encourage recovery and to preserve connectivity when we are in the recovery phase. And the third point is whether there is a case for regulatory reform um, based on the, on the observations that I'm making and the different world we might be in. And so very much, um, especially in this third category, I'm very definitely thinking about in that sort of um, portfolio of airports that I was describing at the beginning, where I'm thinking about um, those airports that have um, significant market power and are regulated whether because to be honest a lot of these policies if the airport doesn't have market power is not regulated there isn't very much that can in a sense can be done in this third category next slide please so first topic is addressing uh, the past and considering the current ongoing losses so obviously the um, key concerns we have in sector are that uh, the unprecedented losses the sector has been, uh, has been experiencing have substantially weakened the balance sheets of these organisations and will really impact on their ability to invest in the future. While that doesn't look like a priority today, it will become a priority um, once, uh, once demand really starts to recover because we all wind ourselves back to 2019 and pre-pandemic. We knew that, in fact, the airport sector uh, in many parts of the world uh, was facing a real capacity crunch and really needed the capacity. So the ability for the sector to invest to um, uh, uh, to meet that capacity when it when it's needed uh, really challenged by the losses that it's suffering today. Um, there's also there are also in, in, in practice there are also sort of capability uh, issues related to you know, loss of expertise and whatever which means that um, uh, there are grounds to, for maintaining the capacity and the capabilities of airports in the present although you could argue that that applies to any business it's not necessarily a special one uh, uh, to um, airports it's worth noting that a lot of these problems may be particularly acute in smaller and regional airports, which were would have been struggling financially in the first instance. We know that smaller airports rarely able to cover their cost of capital to begin with and will have been really struggling. Um, and uh, combined with the uh, cutting of route networks by airlines, 
you could see that this would be a real challenge to those airports, a real challenge to um, regional connectivity as a result. So in terms of should one sort of retrospectively intervene, so to speak, to, um, uh, to assist uh, airports, I guess it comes down um, to two points. One is uh, the observation that um, that uh, you know, we've, we've, we've discussed yesterday, uh, there's a huge demand to travel. There is a, a, a huge pent up demand to travel. The, the fall in demand is not uh, a commercial failure of the airline airport sector. It is a regulatory intervention by government with good reason for public health reasons. But the industry has very largely been shut down for other public policy uh, purposes. And that is a that's that is a major consideration in terms of thinking uh, the case for um, compensation. The other is, of course, that not uniquely, but very much in the minority of sectors, this is a sector that cannot diversify in the way it supplies its product. The, the, the travel is the product it provides. Provides, and my business can retool itself. A retail business can retool how it delivers its. Uh, a product, um, even you know, a restaurant can, to an extent, not perfectly, retool how it delivers its product. But an airport really, really can't. The same way as an airline really can't, if the regulation says that people can't travel. Um, the second point is really to do with, um, I almost almost like philosophical point about what one's attitude is about what has happened, and whether whether the world has changed or whether we've just become wiser about how the world was to begin with. Um, if the why, if if what has happened is a genuinely unpredictable and unexpected event we couldn't have known about, um, then there is an argument saying, well, it's you know, it's in sort of it's force majeure. It's, it's sort of in insurance terms. It's an act of God. Could not have been couldn't have been helped. It's a loss to the existing shareholders and too bad. Um, and it's debatable. You know, there's a lot of evidence to say no. You know, public health authorities have been warning for many years of the risk of this occurring um, and and we as countries have been asleep on the watch as a, uh, you know and that this was this was going to happen and that perhaps our estimation of the commercial risk that our uh, airports especially our regulated airports were facing was greater than we were actually taking on board uh, a related part of that is to actually say if what we're experiencing now is a one-off or whether now actually we are we reassess um, the likelihood of this happening again in future. I mean, I don't, I don't just mean could there be a, a, a third wave in the autumn of this year. I mean, what will what will public authorities' reaction be to another SARS-like scare arising in three years' time or five years' time in some part of the world? You know, will we see will we see a slow reaction like we saw this time, or will we see a very rapid? Will we see the shutting down of international connectivity as a first? line of defense. Now, if we if we think the world has changed in that sense, and or we think that we now are more aware of how the world is, we're accepting that the risk of this business is a different risk to the risk that was originally anticipated. If we think that risk was always there, there is a case for saying we were, we as, if you like, public consumers were underpaying for the, for the service to begin with. And so there could be a case uh, for uh, stepping in. And if all of those things are true, and shareholders, especially private shareholders, are simply left to take the consequences, they will simply have to grin and bear it. You know, the the consequence will be a substantial rise in the cost of finance for airport development moving forward, because they will simply face a much higher risk if they factor in the possibility or the likelihood of infrequent but substantial shutdowns in the in the um in their industry so that's i think the case to discuss i'm leaving it open to the to the to, to all the panelists to for their reaction um issues to face in terms of thinking about that well we should be aware that um we should be very careful about the aid not being selective my what i said at the beginning about there being a wide range of different airports in terms of ownership 
the fact you know whether they're public or private or uh, whatever you know clearly non-discriminatory rules should be uh, uh, arrived at and that should not be uh, uh, ones that favor particular ownership models um loans versus uh, grants or equity injections well loans are useful but obviously not not a uh, in a sense a solution to the problem they're almost like an emergency survival method and that at some level you know there's probably a need to be an injection of more capital and that capital is either injected via equity from the owners whoever they are or it's capital being injected by the customers in terms of paying more for the service uh, but expecting private equity to step in and solve this problem will again require us to be much clearer about what risks the future uh, uh, presents and what risks those investors are expected to face so it, it won't simply happen unless we can get a better handle on how you quantify uh, those risks uh, and finally public injections of equity again noting the first point about being non-discriminatory can be problematic it can be problematic especially if if um, the public um, response is to rescue airports by taking partial ownership of airports. It's going to act as a real damper on the provision of private capital. If the perception is um, they won't be allowed, the private investors will be exposed to this risk. They can't um, uh, offset this risk in any way at all. And that if it occurs again, part of their ownership will be expropriated. So um, uh, the problems, I think I've said enough. Next slide, please. Moving on to the second of my three topics, which was uh, encouraging uh, recovery and uh, supporting connectivity. First obvious you know, observation is based, looking back on that, that graph I showed earlier, based on any reasonable forecasts, whatever faith we place in them, um, it's very likely that the average cost of airport services is going to be significantly higher than we expected for the next few years, because traffic is low, there is a proportion of fixed costs. Can't, costs can't be adjusted down. Um, so that's a reality. At some level, the average cost of providing this service is going to be much higher. Um, but to discuss, you know, the and it, the and this is, I think, the experience of airports this year, last year, is that the airline markets in recovery will still will be so weak that. The expectation that increases in airport charges can be passed on in higher fares is extremely questionable. And if they can't be passed on in higher fares, you will simply be um, passing airport losses to airlines. And there's little obvious justification for doing that, given the extent to which airlines have suffered uh, in the first uh, in the um, um, uh, in the recent past. And that's a condition that's likely to persist for well, I've said here in the slide one to two years, but I'm. I'm, I'm, I made up one to two years. I'll go back to my comment yesterday. I don't know how long it's going to persist for. I can speculate, but it will be problematic. And while those conditions um, persist, we're likely to be in a situation where airports will not be able to cover their costs and their cost of capital. And that means that some level of ongoing support will be needed in the recovery phase um, in order to um, uh, in order to see the sector through. Now that could be in terms of um, uh, general grants to airports. I think that um, it could be in terms of those could be conditional on on various things. I mean, we could discuss whether they should have green strings attached to those uh, to that support. Um, I think in the commercial sense, I think we should also uh, think about. The extent to which we, you know, airports have a strong, um, airports have a strong incentive to try and build up their traffic themselves, and therefore allowing a, a greater degree of commercial flexibility in the way airports go about pricing their services. And if we are talking about airports with market power overall, we would obviously think subject to some overall caps, although over profitability doesn't look like it's likely to be a worry at the moment, but some degree of commercial flexibility in pricing to permit uh, to allow air, airports to work with airlines to try and um, build build up um, 
connectivity again, and perhaps to concentrate in the first instance on essential connectivity where there's also seen to be a public interest in particular routes uh, uh, being maintained. And then the third area, which I'll now go on to, is broader regulatory um, interventions. So Martha, next slide, please. This is my second last slide. So um, in, in a crude sense, most, so now I am definitely talking about air, regulated airports with market power, um, which amounts to a, a, a material number of the large airports, the hubs and such such like, you know, um, is likely to be the case. Um, but most pricing reg regimes effectively amount to some form of average cost price regulation in reality. That is, that, that, that some level of cost is permitted, a level of traffic is estimated, cost divided by traffic gives you a unit, maximum unit price. Um, and those have typically been, not always, so I mean, for instance, the regulation, the other side here, the regulation at Heathrow, this wouldn't apply, but to other airports it does, they will be done within tram lines, so that if traffic goes above or below certain levels, a level of risk sort of exposure has been identified. And if traffic doesn't reach the minimum level or exceeds the maximum level, prices will be recalibrated. So effectively, um, these work as a way of as passing the risk of traffic variation through to passengers in higher or lower airport charges assuming airline markets are competitive and so airport charges are passed on to um, passengers. But these, aren't, these, these arrangements are absolutely not fit for purpose in the current circumstances for a variety of reasons. Um, well, in the first instance, if you imagine just applying these rules today to existing traffic, uh, it, it implies huge increases in airport charges, which are not feasible because as I've described, they, they, they defy commercial logic Airlines would not be able to pass them on, so it would just be passing losses from the airport. The airline would be achieving uh, uh, would be achieving very little. Um, it's not what it's not how these adjustment mechanisms are intended uh, to um, function. Also, there's a huge level of risk uh, involved for the airport investors, whoever they are, because the actual sort of median or mid, uh, your average level of uh, forecast that you're, you're you're putting into these uh, these formulae is I said unknowable yesterday. I'm not sure it's unknowable, but it's 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 very. We don't know what the mean is. We don't know what the variance is. We're not even sure what the shape of the distribution is these days. So um, high levels of risk and very hard to to uh, value those. Um, what this means is that that in the short run, the cost, the average cost increases that are needed can't be implemented. And in fact, we're seeing in some places. It certainly happens in France recently airports have applied for small increases in prices and been told by regulators they're not allowed to increase their prices at all it's understandable at one level but it leaves leaves the airport with nowhere to go it has costs today in this time period it can't recover them and you know um and we don't know what more or less we don't know what the deal is in terms of, we don't know what the regulatory deal is so um and i think uh, a lot of this is partly that in the current circumstances, a lot of these systems, the regulatory building block systems, these sort of simple building block systems are hamstrung by, by, by a level of inflexibility. And often that inflexibility relates to the time, the idea of when costs are incurred and, the, um, and uh, when, uh, when, the, when those costs can be recovered. And um, that needn't be the case. And there are regulatory approaches that can address that uh, situation. And failure to address those, that situation will, I would suggest, like a failure to recognize that we are living in a riskier world generally, lead to um, uh, investors placing a much higher cost on, um, on investing in airport capacity um, with, without recognition of that underinvestment in our facilities and uh, um, uh, 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 with all the, the long run consequences that we might expect to see. So my last slide. So in terms of, just as very briefly then, in terms of regulatory approaches that one could um, follow, um, 
I mean, the first point I would just say as a recommendation is that um, that we need a recognition um, that of, of how, if we are going, especially if we're going to involve private sector investors in airports, of how much risk is being borne by those investors. I mean, just an obvious statement, but you know, some level of understanding of what risk they will be exposed to, and that would both be embodied in the future, the framing of regulation. So. You know, if we go outside these tram lines, what happens? But also to an extent in how we are responding to current losses, because that tells investors something about about uh, 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 about the public appetite to actually you know, take on its share of the uh, responsibility here. Um, and also, I think if we're if we're thinking about um, um, mechanisms for uh, forecasting mechanisms. We need to think about mechanisms that will deal with the with the impossibility of really knowing what a reasonable forecast is. So neither exposing um, operations to um, shortfalls or massive windfalls that result from the that we simply don't know where we put a pin in a map. We didn't know where where it should be, and that it happens to be we were very low or happens to be very high. So we should try and avoid these windfalls in some way. Um, that would be first obvious approach. The, the second would be um, to think more tolerantly about commercial pricing strategies at airports. Um, as I said already, and I, I'm sort of repeating myself, airports have a strong incentive to try and grow, try and rebuild traffic. And they will tend to do that by reflecting demand conditions in the, uh, that, that they see, sharing risk, with their airline partners over which, uh, which routes need support and which routes need less support and recovering their fixed costs in a sort of demand-led way from, uh, from different parts of the portfolio. And I think we need to be much more tolerant about that, that sort of behavior from uh, airports if we expect to see uh, business, um, uh, we see traffic develop. And the final point, which is getting a little techy, forgive me, but is, um, is that we need to, to have a, a, a slightly new view about sort of, sort of uh, about the sort of intertemporal nature of cost. Now, this is something that speaking from a UK perspective, I feel UK regulators in airports, but also in other infrastructure sectors are very well aware of. That is that there is a, uh, there is a source, there is a sort of separation between accounting costs and regulatory costs. Um, there is a um, there is a, an ability to uh, be flexible about when costs can be uh, recovered. So one example would be the potential to, if one can agree on that share of losses that need to be uh, that that the investor was not properly exposed to, they can be capitalized into the regulatory asset base of the, um, of the company. Now that sometimes goes against the grain in some, in some places where they say, well, there's no physical asset associated with that. Right? But it, if it gets capitalized into the RAB and it gets honored, it can be recovered at some future point. But then it can get recovered at some future point flexibly over an agreed time period, which need not be driven by an asset life or a, a specific, you know, the cost was incurred in this period, so the revenue would be incurred in this period, but actually uh, can simply be amortized over an agreed period. Um, and um, that's, that can also be done by other models, like for instance, uh, applying the recovery of costs not to time periods, like in a sort of straight line depreciation sense, but recovering it on a sort of output basis, which is something you see in uh, project finance frequently. I mean, I think you could finance a baggage handling system at an airport on a charge per bag basis until the costs are recovered. Um, and that will have a particularly low risk profile. If you allowed the airport to recover its costs on a movement basis, this would be equivalent to a concession, which says the concession time period is flexible up to the point where the costs invested by the concessionaire have been recovered. This is, there are examples of this. They, they look different in different circumstances, but there are various different examples where this can be, uh, this can be dealt with. Um, 
And the, when I say, you know, these costs could be rolled forward and amortized over a period of time, how long is a matter of policy judgment, right? And part of the point is that they need to be, part of the reason why you will roll, if you want to do this and roll forward these costs, you would, um, you would do it, you are partly doing it to protect airlines because you want to make sure that you, you only attempt to recover these costs when the passenger actually becomes exposed to them, i.e. when airport airline competition has recovered to the point where, where we can reasonably expect airport charges are largely passed through in, uh, in fares. I've probably gone on longer than I meant to. Um, I'll pass over to Michael now. Anyway, I, I, I think that's more than enough ideas to throw in the pot. <laughs>